Good evening and good morning from wherever you are all uh, joining us. Welcome to the next episode of the Poland 3D uh, discussion series. Um, today I'm very honored to have with us uh, Minister Leonor uh, Gewessler from Austria, who is the Minister for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Innovation, Technology and Mobility as well. And I'll jump right into it. Minister, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. Um, your portfolio includes very specific, uh, very broad, very wide range of very specific topics, but indeed very crucial aspects um, in, today's, uh, in today's world. Um, and I want to focus on two for the, for the moment, for the start. What do you see the relation is between um, you know, technological advancement, innovation, and the fight against climate change, which we are all uh, battling uh, today? Well, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation to this dialogue and send my good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever our uh, listeners are based on, on this uh, wonderful planet. So indeed, um, the portfolio of my ministry is broad and it's the first time in Austrian history that we have all these areas in one ministry. So that's a big opportunity but also a big task. Um, it's a huge responsibility also for the ministry to uh, come up with new and creative approaches with synergies between the different parts of the portfolio because uh, everything we need for climate action from the immediate solutions we have now uh, from the energy and the mobility uh, question up until innovation and technology. And I think that the fight against the climate crisis makes right and, and innovative solutions more important than ever, but also makes correct um, technological choices more vital than ever before. In terms of uh, innovation, I think we all agree that uh, technological innovation can make significant contribution to mitigating gr greenhouse gas emissions. And I think governments and industry um, all across the globe have indispensable roles in the task of maximizing technology's impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But um, also making the right choices in terms of technology is vital, um, not only for uh, the fight against the climate crisis, but also for making sure that we don't end up with stranded investment in, in terms of our uh, economic systems. So, uh, fuel switch, the, the renewable energy expansion, uh, energy efficiency are all uh, really crucial parts of this equation. But I'd like to, to point out in, in that uh, perspective that while technology, I think we all agree, is vital, technology alone is not the answer. If we um, really want to go where uh, we're all headed, climate neutrality by 2050, in Austria we're even a bit more ambitious, climate neutrality by 2040, then uh, we need more than technological fixes. We need new industrial processes. We need changes to our economic and tax systems. We also need behavioral uh, change. So we need social and societal innovation as well. And I think this is the, the bigger picture, but um, given the fact we're right now in a very um, extraordinary situation in the middle of a big health crisis, I, I think what we can take from the Corona crisis is that we see how really fundamental changes in behavior are possible within a very short moment in time. And um, maybe that is something we can build on also in our fight against the climate crisis and take it as, a, as one, of, one of the instruments in our toolbox for the fight against the climate crisis. Indeed, I, I do think that the changes in also people's behavior is something we've observed quite, quite a lot since, since April or, or March. Um, and, and, well, let's hope that that continues in the positive direction as far as, you know, positive action in terms of the, the battle against climate change is concerned as well. You also mentioned the economics uh, for a moment there, which I think is also very much intertwined with technological advancement, but also this uh, green recovery, which uh, is being talked about. The, the United Nations um, Secretary General, the Deputy Secretary General, they've both uh, been uh, urging member states to, 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 to have a, indeed a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but having said that, uh, I found this very interesting um, statistic from the recent G20 uh, summit, whereby the, the member states have actually said they have committed that 
more, 50% more funding for actually fossil fuel related economies. And um, so there the question is, what can we actually do indeed to ensure that the economic recovery from the pandemic, which has hit economies worldwide, um, is indeed green, uh, given these news uh, coming to us from the G20 summit um, just last week? I think it's, it's vital that we all pull our strength, that green recovery is not just a phrase, but we actually work on it, we deliver on it. And um, it, it's ever more important because the COVID-19 crisis, and we're all working hard on it, research is working hard on it, medicine is, medical research is working hard on it, it will pass. And we will have hopefully soon a vaccination that will um, lead the way out of this uh, really exceptional situation. But the climate crisis is here to stay and there will be no vaccination against the climate crisis. The only, the only thing we can do is to act, to act decisively, rapidly and, and with all uh, strength ahead to, towards the goal of climate neutrality. And so I think it's really crucial that in this moment in time that this, um, this, um, yeah, this very specific moment in time we use um, to do things differently than we did in the last crisis. So we need to make sure we don't just build back more of the same, but in reviving our economies that uh, we really use this current situation as an opportunity to make sure that we build back better, we build back greener, we build back societies and economies that are more resilient also to future crises such as the climate crisis. So I think it's really crucial that we use our programs to leverage climate action. And this goes for near-term spending as well as medium and long-term uh, spending. And um, it's, it's not only because of climate action, but also because this really delivers a benefit, not only in climate action, but in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, the economic system. Maybe we can talk about that a, a little bit more later on also. But um, I think, so that's why what we in Austria do in, in, in this moment in time, and maybe I can talk a bit about how we, did, how we designed our recovery package, because we were really trying also now to reward the committed ones, the innovative ones, the ones who want to, to move ahead with us towards climate neutrality. And um, I think we also, in, in doing so, we also um, deliver and implement the, 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 the guiding principles of the Green Deal in terms of um, implementing this uh, and also staying true to a do no harm principle in the recovery measures. So what we did was that we um, uh, drew up within our recovery package, um, the uh, most comprehensive and biggest climate investment package that Austria has ever seen. So we have an adi additional 2 billion euro uh, for the next years um, for climate action and climate uh, recovery measures. This package comes on top of an increased climate budget that we've uh, budgeted this year and already also for the next year. So right now we have as much money in climate action as never before in Austria. And with this, we want to um, start initiatives such as uh, the, uh, an Austrian version of the European renovation wave, uh, insulating houses, but also making changes to heating systems additional support for uh, renewable energy for the switch to renewable not only electricity but really energy um, that, um, move to more climate friendly innovation technology so also additional um, investments in uh, research and development we're working on a tax system that supports climate action uh, but also a lot of money goes into public transport and the expansion of service on public transport um, i think but I'd like to highlight maybe one instrument because um, it's also a first time we do it like that in Austria. It's an investment premium, which was designed um, really as a recovery measure to stimulate or to help leverage also private investment at this point in time, to stabilize the economy, to make sure we have, um, we stabilize um, investment in the real economy. But what we did, we made this investment premium a tool for climate action. So we double the premium if you invest in digitalization and in climate action. So the premium moves from 7 to 14% for everything climate related. But we also did something that was completely new to Austria. We excluded uh, investments in fossil fuel infrastructure or in um, combustion engines. So we excluded 
investments that are harmful to the to climate action. And I think this is really where we need to go in the future to um, use every tool we have towards climate action, but also to make sure we do not invest any longer in the past, will, which will hinder us to move forward to climate action. I think that there, this, this specific plan that you mentioned there, very well goes back to our first discussion point and the link between digitization and technology and climate change. And there, I think there we have it. That's a very practical, very specific example. Um, and indeed, I do want to now move on even further into, into Austria, so to speak. So, I mean, Austria has been a leader in sustainability for years now. I think the fact that your portfolio as of, as of January 2020 encompasses these critical fields also gives significance to the issue. And Austria, by means of, of having you as, the, as a minister of such important um, topics, also highlights the significance of them and that it is not just indeed a a marketing um, sort of word, the, the green recovery, but it's actually practical results and practical um, policies. Um, Austria's, uh, you know, um, has a strong focus indeed on renewable energy. I think a third of the of the energy mix is comes from renewable energy. And as you mentioned earlier, there's the goal of climate neutrality by 2040, which is more ambitious than what we see in in, in, in the European Union mm, as a whole. And the question really is, how is that actually possible to achieve in Austria? And you know, also, why is it not possible to achieve in other countries? Would you say it's because um, the idea of sustainability is so rooted in Austrian society? Um, would you say that it's the way that the governance is done in the country? What reasons do you look for when you try to, uh, when you try to um, address that? To start with where we are at the moment yeah I, austria has very ambitious goals now and with our new government we've we've made climate action one of the central pillars of this government program but to stay true to history we have also some catching up to do um, we um so we really have to move from flatlining emissions to sharply declining emissions and so there's quite some work to do especially in the mobility sector. I think that's an issue that many, especially European countries share. Uh, so so there's, there's a lot of work to do. But on the other hand, of course, uh, Austria has a history um, in, in some of the fields uh, that, um, for example, waste management, starting blocks for, the, for a circular economy, but even more so in renewable energy, where we've made good decisions already a long time ago. So Austria in the electricity sector, we start with a very high share of renewable electricity in the system. So we, we are um, more than 70% uh, of renewable electricity already now. But of course, also here, um, going back to the mobility sector, overall energy consumption, we are about a third uh, of renewables in the system. So um, of course, this means also we have a lot of work to do. And um, I think what's, what's crucial in, 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 in this transformation that we have ahead, and without a doubt, the energy system is a central building block, decarbonizing the energy system, moving towards renewables in the energy system, is the central building block of this transformation. And so I think what's, what's crucial is that we, that we are clear on this, that we have a clear political goal, that this is where the journey is going, that all, um, levels of, um, of governance. Austria is a federal state, so um, there's a big role of the of communities, but also of the private sector uh, in making this transformation possible. For example, in um, mobilizing the space, mobilizing private investment. But of course, the central government um, has a, a crucial role in, in building the right framework to enable this transformation. And so we're um, just now working on the biggest energy legislation package that Austria has seen in a long time with the Renewables Deployment Act, which will um, put on completely new feet our uh, renewable support scheme, um, which will also leverage um, private investment in uh, renewable, elect uh, renewable generation capacity. And um, this will help us reach the goal of having 100% renewable electricity by 2030 and then 
towards um, being completely climate neutral by 2040. So um, we have quite a task in uh, until 2030 to uh, have an additional 27 terawatt hours of renewable generation in Austria. And um, so this is what we're working on with the Renewable Deployment Act, where I think um, one of the key pillars also in this is um, the renewable energy communities, which is provided for already by European legislations, but we are now among the first countries to actually implement it. And why do I think this is a crucial building block? Because it brings citizens on board. Mm. It makes citizens not only consumers of electricity or energy, but actually actors, active participants in the energy system. And I think this does a lot with acceptance of this transformation, with being actually in a, in a steering role in this transformation. And I think this is, apart from many other questions we have to solve, energy system integration, sector coupling, all the technical issues we have in this transformation, I think uh, getting people on board as actors in this transformation is crucial. Indeed, and civic, one, civic participation is, I think, one of the keys here and getting citizens on board, like rightly, uh, how rightly you, you indeed say. I think the, the Austrian story is indeed, you know, inspiring in the sense that you sort of do show that economic growth can go hand in hand with environmental policies, but you also sort of, you don't rest on your laurels. So you are aware of the fact that you have to keep on going and you have to keep on keep on doing more. And I think that is a really important message um, uh, that will definitely stay after, after our discussion um, today. You, we mentioned briefly, you know, research and development innovation in general. Um, I found that 3% of the, of the country's GDP is actually spent on research and development. So the, broadly speaking, the innovation sector. Um, could you perhaps share some of the key projects in this sphere that, uh, that you are currently working on and when, what significance do they indeed have? I think, um, indeed, you're right. Austria um, spends currently around 3% uh, of GDP on research and uh, development spending. So we're, we have the second highest share in, in the EU after Sweden. Um, so we started this discussion with a focus on innovation. And I think research and development R&D is the basis for finding solutions for the most pressing uh, issues, such as the climate crisis but it's also key for our future, current and future competitiveness. And uh, that links also back to the previous question we discussed. It's, it's um, whatever we do in, in, uh, in climate action is not just because we want to ensure we have a planet to live on by the mid of this century, that, that we humans can safely live on and have a good life uh, on this planet, but also because I'm convinced that the only way to keep our competitiveness economic competitiveness in Austria, in Europe globally, is to uh, have innovative green products and production processes, because this is where the competitiveness of the future lies. And that's also a, a second aspect in, in why we focus a lot on research and innovation, why we have put additional money in, uh, in research and innovation, also with the stimulus uh, programs. What we focus on in, in my ministry is, um, so, we focus on the applied research, uh, technology and innovation in domains such as ICT, green production processes, mobility and transport, energy and climate issues, as I mentioned earlier, environment, also space. And um, for example, if I can mention two very concrete examples that we work on is one, I think a topic that many countries are now working on uh, is AI. So artificial intelligence, we're working on a strategy in Austria. Um, but not only AI as a, again, as an end in itself, but AI also with a view of how it can best contribute to reaching our climate aims. And I think that's a, that's a switch in thinking that we sometimes need to, to do, that research and development, not only on classical green tech, where Austria has, been, has a strong point from the past, uh, but in, in making tech green, so tech for green. And so this is the... the, 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 the um, the, the, the lenses or the glasses we, we look at when we look at artificial intelligence uh, now. A second area we work on, just to highlight two, yeah, is uh, urban innovation and um, sustainable urban development. 
cities um, are not only important as laboratories for uh, for many things, future mobility patterns, um, circular economy uh, patterns, and, and many more. But uh, I think also in terms of mobility patterns are, are crucial that uh, the cities really um, develop sustainably and in, in a green way. And so these are just two examples that, that we work on very intensively also in a European context. And if, if our viewers are more interested uh, in that, um, we publish everything on our website. So in, in terms of open innovation, all the uh, results from the uh, research program that the ministry supports are also publicly available. So I can invite interested uh, persons to actually have a look at the website if you want more information on that. Brilliant. I'm very happy you mentioned cities and urban innovation. It's something very close to my heart. I actually did my my master thesis was actually on Vienna as a sustainable oh. city. And it was a comparison between how Vienna is doing in that field in comparison to Warsaw and how what are the differences, what are the similarities. So, so that topic is indeed very close to my heart because I see cities as the area where when we look at the 17 sustainable development goals as part of Agenda 2030. Things like education, healthcare, transport, climate change, um, production, consumption, they all enact in cities. And that is why I see cities as indeed a major mechanism here. I'm looking I at the think, clock. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one sentence on that. And I think the comparative perspective is crucial because we can learn so much from each other. We don't all have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I am looking at the clock. I don't want to take too much more of your time. So I'll just ask one very last question, but one really relevant. Um, so we move to the online world. We are speaking online today, um, right now. Um, what is your take on, on digital security in today's time? Have we made enough progress before the pandemic hit? Have we learned enough? And where, where are we going as far as digital security is concerned? Also in schools, I think that is a, a crucial aspect here. So in, indeed, we are talking uh, in a virtual way. I think uh, the pandemic has given many of our countries and also many of the sectors a digitalization boost. And I think there's no way around digitalization. Many of the solutions, innovative solutions uh, we need in mobility in many other areas will uh, improve and will build on good uh, digital solutions. But there's one aspect of this we shouldn't uh, ignore, of course, more applications, more servers, more app, more appliances um, also have uh, a, an increase our energy consumption. So um, increase our resource use, require new infrastructure. So we also need to think about how we can green the sector itself. So that's for the for the headlines. But in terms of the um, of security, I think there's many aspects to that. Not least the fact. That we um, that we create with this an unknown data pool and new monitoring options um, that we really have to that can significantly improve the basis of our work, but also have new risks and need a new focus on the security question. So that's why I think it's a crucial um, crucial topic. I think in all areas we need to be sure that we not only have the technology reliable available reliably available but also that we um, are resistant to failures, to threats. So I think, um, so that's also why we commissioned a study in my ministry on the issue of new security requirements associated with automatization, with uh, networking, also what, what are barriers, what are potentials. And I think overall the, the um, awareness in, in the different sectors of um of production especially is is very has increased from a security perspective so sectors such as the financial industry or the energy industry are probably much more or are further ahead already but at the same time i think some many production um companies or other sectors probably still pay too little attention to the fact so i think that's why we really need to work on it um because um Digitalization will stay, is here to stay. It's good that it's here to stay, but we need to also address all the societal challenges we have uh, in the field. 
Minister, thank you very much for today's discussion. I think the topics we, we mentioned, it's very difficult to cover them in depth in a 20, 25 minute discussion, but you've given us an excellent bird's eye view of how Austria is doing. There are some really concrete examples. And I think two things that really stuck with me are, are the civic participation and this change in mindset that you are saying that the, all these policies and mechanisms are not just there for, for climate change alone or innovation in itself, but it's a means for another goal. And it's, it's, it's all a bit like a domino effect, whereby these elements are indeed interconnected. Um, so thank you very much again. Uh, I wish you all the very best, lots of health and uh, Dankeschön. Same, stay healthy, everyone, you and everyone who's watching. Uh, thanks a lot for the debate. Thank you very much.